July 2012, Radha Krishna, a 40-year-old farmer from Little Buddha, India, tried to commit suicide by immolating himself in front of the governor's house. The police immediately pinned the farmer down and arrested him. In his shirt pocket, they found a note stating that he was committing suicide to protest against the injustice in society. More than a quarter of a million farmers have committed suicide in the last 17 years in India, making for the largest wave of recorded suicides in human history. Many of these individuals face mounting debts, the inability to get credit from banks, and the failure of their cash crops, all factors associated with neoliberal policies adopted by the states. The tragic consequences of the global economic crisis and political repression can also generate moral shock that leads to resistance and mobilizing for democracy. On December 17, 2010, Mohammed Bouazizi, a 26-year-old high school educated street vendor and breadwinner for a family of eight working in the city of Sidi Bouazizi, Tunisia, immolated himself after his livelihood was threatened. A policewoman had confiscated his vegetable cart and its goods, collected the fine of dollar seven, and then, according to witnesses, slapped him, spat on his face, and insulted his dead father. Bouazizi unsuccessfully sought justice from the state. He repeatedly requested meetings with the local officials and had lodged a complaint that was refused less than an hour before he set himself on fire. Bouazizi's suicide tapped into an amplified resentment against rising unemployment fueled by the power of the state and its oppressive policies. A wave of demonstrations in the streets immediately ensued, sparking the Tunisian Revolution and the Greater Arab Spring. The consequences of poverty, lack of opportunity, and gendered violence can be particularly severe for women and children. On December 16, 2010, Maricela Escobedo was shot dead as she continued to protest the lack of justice in the murder of her 16-year-old daughter, Ruby, two years earlier. Ruby's body, 39 pieces of charred bone, was found in a dump in Juarez, Mexico. Maricela's fight for justice for her daughter directly confronted a system of sexism, corruption, and impunity. Juarez has been called the city of femicides for the murder of hundreds of young women, often raped and tortured. This border city of one million has also been decimated by more than 3,000 murders since 1990, giving it the title of the murder capital of the world. However, these stories are not only about India, Tunisia, and Mexico. In fact, they exist in the most developed countries too. These stories tell us of despair, but also struggles for social justice and social change. They're also emblematic inequalities and both significant challenges too, and opportunities for promoting social justice and democratic institutions. These examples also highlight similar injustices in very different societies. Many activists, and Latin America knows much of this, have also highlighted similar injustices in very similar, in very different societies. They have come together across borders to challenge a global economic and political system that deepens social injustices globally. On October 2011, vast numbers of people, many more than we are here today, took to the streets and squares in over 1,000 cities and 82 countries to end inequality and for global change. They raised their voices to let politicians and bankers know that they do not represent the 99%. Condemning poverty, inequality, environmental devastation, corporate and government collusion, they firmly, but without violence, demanded social justice and insisted that the majority, the will of the majority be heard. 
So let me add a few comments on the state of the world. The emergence of the information and high-tech economy has redefined notions of time, space, boundaries and borders. By altering the social and natural environments, these developments have also changed patterns of global interaction. States have increasingly enabled and accommodated the economic forces of the global market economy, often in the interest of a new class of global transnational elite, but with little opportunities or protections for the poor, marginalized and dispossessed. Remarkable strides in technology, science, medicine and communication have been accompanied by deepening social and economic inequalities and the persistence of human rights violations. Over 1.4 billion live in poverty. 3.5 billion, or 50% of the world, live on less than two and a half dollars a day. Over 780 million people still have unsafe drinking water. That is approximately one in nine people. On the other hand, the 10 richest people in the world are cumulatively worth $395.4 billion. If they created their own country, these 10, they would have the 30th largest GDP of the 182 countries. Now, the International Labour Organization's annual report on global labour conditions released in April, on April 30th, 2012, has forecast that more than 200 million workers will be unemployed in 2012. 50 million jobs have been wiped out since the 2008 financial crisis, and they do not expect a worldwide recovery in jobs and incomes for at least another five years. The recent women's, UN Women's Progress Report notes that there have been strides in women's legal rights but vast numbers of women continue to be denied the control over their own bodies, including in the United States. Excluded from decisions making and denied the protection from, from, from violence, you have 600 and, 603 million still living in places where domestic violence is not considered a crime. And even where there is some progress in legal frameworks, millions of women report experiencing violence in their lifetimes, and usually at the hands of an intimate partner. The systematic targeting for brutal sexual violence is also characteristic of our modern day conflicts. Human rights, much of what we're going to talk today, still seems out of reach for large numbers of people and women too. The consequences of poverty, lack of opportunity, can be particularly severe for LGBTQ, ethnic and religious minorities. Deep social inequalities exist, but not only in economic regions, but also within societies, including the wealthiest economies. In the United States, the top 1% control 40% of the total wealth, almost a quarter of the total country's income. There are approximately 50.7 million uninsured in the U.S., which is roughly 16.3% with no health insurance. Just to put this into perspective, that's 1.5 times the population of Canada. These stark inequalities and injustice have led to growing unrest across the world among those who face the brunt of economic exploitation, social exclusion, and political repression. Issues of social justice and democratization are being pushed to the forefront. We have witnessed the use of new social media as well as the growth and proliferation of horizontal transnational networks of individuals and NGOs. And we've seen them used during the Arab Spring. Ordinary people across the globe are mobilizing and challenging oppressive social, political and economic regimes with indomitable courage, striving for social justice and daring against all odds to take the difficult but by no means linear or standard roads to democratization. In some societies, the struggle to achieve social justice has involved electoral reform and attempts to dismantle the existing state apparatus. In others, it has involved efforts to increase popular participation in state policy formulation and implementation. Still in others, movements have sought 
to create alternative institutions that embody direct democracy and de-link communities from corporations and the state. The roles taken depend upon the strategies and power relations among the particular states, corporations and movements. So what is the role of sociology in the 21st century? The 21st century poses its own quagmire of complex issues and formidable dilemmas that require us as a global community of sociologists to increasingly participate as stronger societal stakeholders in building a more just society. We need to have a presence in the media. We need to put forth our perspectives in accessible ways. We as sociologists have much to offer if we form research and teaching partnerships with organizations promoting social justice and democratization. These partnerships deepen our understanding of local manifestations of social justice and democracy and effective transformative strategies in certain social contexts. Now, in a gathering of primarily sociologists, I don't have to recount the history of what we've done. We know that sociologists and social scientists have long been interested in generating research that affects social transformation. Take, for example, the works of Karl Marx, Harriet Martineau, Emil Durkheim, Jane Addams, W.E.B. Du Bois, Annabel Puehano, Gunnar Mirdal, M. N. Srinivas, Susie Castor, Pablo Gonzalez Casanova, and Florestan Fernandez, to so just to name a very few. We're also familiar with transformation brought by, a group of by groups of sociologists. For instance, feminist sociologists have highlighted gender inequalities and their inter intersectionality with other forms of inequalities providing important theoretical frameworks and methodologies and practices to proactively address social justice. They have shown women's contributions and the challenges women encounter in the process of democratization. And you're going to hear much about many of these issues later in the plenary and other sessions. As sociologists have documented, social movements in different parts of the globe have challenged dominant structures and various types of systematic discrimination. Latin American sociologists have historically played an important role in addressing issues of social justice and democratization, very often going against the winds. Surely the tsunami, social tsunamis of inequality in the 21st century require us as sociologists to critically re-examine and reassess existing theories and methods of research, as well as offer new formulations that can illuminate the ongoing global crisis. The times we live in need more equitable, collaborative relationships between sociologists and larger publics if you wish to contribute to the promotion of social justice and democracy. Activists theorize and have forms of knowledge often devalued in academia particularly mainstream academia, though this is slowly changing. Collaborations with movements and communities make our scholarship not only more relevant, but also more rigorous, and you'll hear some of this in the open forum. We have to strengthen our theories and methods by partnering with communities, not only to document social injustices, human rights violations, political and economic inequality, corruption, government and corporate collusion, but most importantly, for offering paths to global fairness and develop effective strategies for social change. In the process of these collaborations, we have to consider what is meant by democratization in the 21st century. What are the effective forms of contestation? What are the processes of democratic transitions? And how are the social boundaries of communities formed? But let me take a moment here to say the importance of our research must be and is matched by the importance of our teaching. We must ensure as teachers, not just as researchers, that our students and publics see how sociology offers important ways to examine, understand and influence the world we live in. We need to expand the classroom to be more inclusive, especially when we know education is being excluded to many, and we, Michael spoke about this example here where it's open admissions. 
We need to see that we effectively incorporate emergent technologies to create free and open collective spaces for collective knowledge production, consumption, and distribution. So let me conclude by noting that despite all of the violent inequalities that plague the world, I am consistently struck, particularly as a sociologist who works with communities, I am persistently and consistently struck by people's relentless pursuit of justice and democracy. Whether it is Radha Krishna, the farmer in India, Maricela Escobedo in Mexico, Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia, the indignados and the hundreds of thousands of Occupy protesters across the world, people are increasingly conscious of the injustices that favor the few at the expense of the many. As a discipline, sociologists need to intensify our focus upon critically addressing the connections and contradictions between globalization, social justice, and democratization. This second ISA forum is timely as it brings us together to truly explore how we as sociologists, as engaged citizens, and as human beings can substantively address issues of social justice and democratization. Four days with hundreds and hundreds of sessions organized by the ISA research committees, important collaborations with local organizing committee, ALAS and us, providing an amazing opportunity to broaden and deepen our sociological lens on social justice and democratization. We get the opportunity to think about the possibilities for how to further and more effectively partner with the broader publics to reduce social inequalities. <clears throat> I am confident that when we look back upon this time, we will see this as a moment when our diverse voices, all those 88 countries, all those thousands of people, all our diverse voices as sociologists come together using our sociological imagination to leave sociological footprints for paths to a more just world. Thank you and welcome once again to all of you.